This is an event that's being held by the South African Chamber of Commerce, of which I am the chairman of the South African Chamber, and I look forward to spending the next hour with all of you, and particularly with our most illustrious panel. Our whole panel is all from the Southern Hemisphere. They all have the most amazing stories to share with us, and also some insights into things that I have to say are things I am not I don't commonly come into contact with. So I found the engagement with this team unbelievably interesting and challenging um, and learning something new about the country. So I hope all of you are going to be in exactly the same position as I am. We've been running a series of webinars since the lockdown started. And the interesting thing is having gone from a live environment of events, we've now come to a stage where we are virtual. It's a bit like you know, when you go into a, sort of some of these old buildings with these beautiful stained glass windows. I'm convinced my computer's now stained glass window of faces. It just seems to be locked in there. There's just these permanent faces on everything. Um, we, we've been running these events to bring relevance to our members, to provide networking opportunities, um, continuous professional development, uh, insights from people they would never have had the opportunity to make contact with. For example, we recently had the governor of the Reserve Bank. And we're looking to set up a, another webinar with him in January or February, which given South Africa's current conditions will be an extremely interesting webinar. So please watch our website for those of you who don't know us. Um, the whole point of the chamber is the ability to network, to do business, to do trade with South Africa and to do trade with the UK from South Africa. So it's important for us to have these opportunities to be together. Now, the advantage that COVID has brought through the Zoom environment is we actually have a better uh, pool of speakers to work from because you don't have to have them on site and we have a much bigger audience because they equally don't have to be on site <clears throat> and therefore reaching a much larger network than we were doing before and this adds the networking value to all of those of you who do join us we've got people today who have joined us from probably the globe i'm not sure if we've quite made every continent but we must be pretty close to it but we have got a very very sound um contingent from the african continent and from the united kingdom island so we've got a lot of people from both of those i'd also start to start at this point to thank uh Ziander Geisman, who is from grahamstown the eastern cape and who's there at the moment she brought this whole idea as one of our exco members to us and has brought with through the process of introducing us to her aunt, Nunkita Geisman, who you will get to meet shortly, and she'll be spending some time teaching us all the things she's already taught me. Um, just some logistics. I won't have to tell you where the fire exit is. I think you're at home and you probably know where it is. What we will just ask you to say is that you can engage with me, with the panelists, by using the Q&A function. The most important is, if, or if you put up your, your question, uh, the panelists won't be looking at them. I will be looking at them and I'll be posing your questions in the last third of the session. So if we have plenty, that's great. You probably all get your questions seen to. So I do encourage you to ask relevant questions to the issues. Um, if you want to make some statements, by all means, just state this as a statement and we'll share that with the panel afterwards. Um, that's all the health and safety I need to tell you about. Um, I now would like to introduce you to the moderator for today, Isabella. Um, Isabella, that name is longer than my ability to say one, one word. I thought the Welsh were good at, at, at making long words, but you really, I'm not even going to try it. I should have done that in the practice session. This beautifully spoken young lady of the world uh, was educated in Rhodes University in the Eastern Cape. Uh, she's worked as a journalist, both locally, regionally, and international news and media outlets, including the SADC Press Trust, Publishers of the South African Economist, Reuters News Agency Africa Journal, and Interpress Services Africa Regional Bureau. She served as a team leader of women's rights and gender equality organizations and initiatives in Zimbabwe, her home country, and elsewhere. She's designed aid Action Aid International's Guidance Framework for Working with Women's Rights Organization. That is a mouthful. If we have time at some point, if you could maybe just, when you introduce yourself, you might tell us very quickly in one sentence what that long sentence actually means. At this point, you don't need to listen to me anymore. I'll pick up with you in the Q&A session and at the end, and I'd like to hand over now to the lovely Isabella. 
it's all yours. She's so more trained at this than I am. Over to you, Isabella. Thank you, Sharon, and tremendous gratitude to the Chamber uh, for availing this platform to all of us. It's really a delight to be moderator of this session, focusing on the winds of change and really looking at what the Constitutional Court's decision regarding um, the constitutionality of the Electoral Act uh, in South Africa will generate for us. To lead us in thinking, I'm delighted um, to invite my sister and a dear friend, Nomchita Heisman. She is a Black African feminist, a researcher, an analyst, and an advocate for women's rights. She develops training material and facilitates workshops. For the last six years, she's worked as the head of gender at the Southern African Development Community Parliament, and she was posted there by the South African Parliament. There, she worked with female parliamentarians. She's a published author of academic journals, and she is called upon to commentate on various issues to do with gender equality, politics, and women's empowerment in South Africa. At the moment, she's also documenting the stories and experiences of female military veterans from the SADC member states working together with the Wits University Press. Nomchita, welcome. Please, can you kindly turn your camera on uh, so that um, our colleagues who are in the audience can identify you? We're also joined by uh, Tsepang Tsita Mosena, who is a Black African transformation agent, a young woman politician from Lesotho, and an advocate for women's rights. She's a seasoned motivator, trainer, and business coach, as well as with her partner. She is with uh, Twin Talk, a brand where she drives business there, specializing on uh, working with women and youth on empowerment, entrepreneurs and business coaching. She enjoys unleashing the potential within and providing personal mentorship. Um, she has sponsored in her capacity as a parliamentarian, a number of motions in line with her vision for economic emancipation and economic dignity in the parliaments in Lesotho and at SADC. Uh, Tsepang, welcome. We are really delighted that you could join us. Please also feel free to turn your camera on. It's lovely that you're part of the team. And lastly, our brother who is sitting in Grahamstown, Tapelo Tsalapedi, who uh, is pursuing his academic career at Rhodes University, where he is teaching in the Department of Political Science and pursuing his PhD. Previously, he was with the University of Johannesburg as a lecturer. He was named in 2017 uh, by UJ as one of 100 independent thinkers in the country. He's widely published in the press in South Africa, and he serves as a board member on the Legal Advisory and Information Center, uh, a public interest law clinic that is based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Tapelo, if you'd like to turn your, your camera on so that our audience can also see you. Thank you very much. And Tapelo, if you could stay on camera and unmute yourself, we're gonna begin with you. Um, really globally, South Africa's progressive constitution is regarded as one of the best constitutions in the world, together with the legislation that undergirds the constitution. Um, like many development countries though, South Africa is challenged by a variety of very deep and genuine socioeconomic issues. Given the scenario that we're talking about today, right? How do you see the new electoral system that will unfold in South Africa, improving the socioeconomic context and challenges that are faced in South Africa? Over to you, Tapelo. You no, know, um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, but I think it's important as we you know, look at this question to first look at how this, this judgment came about, who are the people who are involved in this judgment. Um, and, 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 I, and I think what we need to start with is that most importantly from the, the court judgment and those who were involved is that this was mostly about freedom of association as opposed to accountability. 
Now, when I talk about freedom of association, I'm specifically here talking about the, the rights of ordinary South Africans to choose who to, who to associate with politically. So not necessarily with the Democratic Alliance or the African National Congress or the EFF for that matter. And so there came about legally space for, for those who are independent candidates outside of the, you know, the traditional political parties to contest both provincial and national elections, at least for the parliamentary seats. That's, that's one thing. I think as a corollary to that, it's important to also note that this doesn't change the sort of parliamentary system that we have, that, that presidents are elected through the parliament. So the majority party or perhaps majority you know, independent candidates at, this, at the later period would be able to then elect the, the, the president from there. So to that extent, the Concord judgment does not change the, the election of a president in parliament, it merely just says that independent candidates can run uh, for both provincial and national legislature parliament effectively. Um, now, now, you know, there's sort of pros and cons to that, and I'd like to sort of outline some of them. Just starting with the pros, I think it's quite important to note that certainly given the constituency basis of independent candidates, it will definitely decrease the voter apathy. I think there will be people who you know, who perhaps may be dissatisfied with the current electoral process and the sort of options available to them. Um, they may be able to get those citizens and those voters to, to then vote for, for, for those independent candidates. But, but, but it's also quite important to, to note that on this, on this issue, um, among the political parties, those that leave the ANC are more likely to, to, those that leave the ANC and then go for independent candidacy are more likely to get the votes as opposed to those who leave the DA or the EFF or other sort of minority parties. And, and that also says that it's quite difficult for sort of independent candidates with no history of political party affiliation to then run um, and be able to gain a seat, whether, you know, you know, whether at local government or provincial and national uh, parliamentary level. So to that extent, there is a level of bias. But, but also what's important is that about the positive thing is that this could also force traditional political parties to at least reform the nomination process to make sure that a lot of the candidates, they feel, um, they feel that national and provincial levels are more legitimate, um, obviously respond to the direct needs and interests um, of, of the communities that they represent and also are much more you know, morally upright. Which, which is a big issue right now. But I think the negatives, especially when you're looking at the sort of, you know, people that were involved in the court case, you know, and also given the, the inability of South Africa as a whole to sort of cohere around a common political program, is that you will find that also independent candidates do and can represent constituencies that are ethnic bases, you know. Um, you, will, you will find it in pockets of the country. So, so that is one component to sort of watch out for given, given that inability for the South African post-1994 project to cohere around a political program. But, but around that is also the issue of one inexperience or the lack of experience, the lack of organizational machinery, and, 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 and just the issue around, you know, do, do they have the experience to run a political campaign? Do they have the funding to run a political campaign? That will put, particularly at the national and provincial level, um, it would weigh down for it would weigh down independent candidates to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, toe -to -toe with a lot of political parties, with a lot of established political parties. So it's not just an issue of funding, it will be experience, but also in terms of do they have the organizational machinery to, to exert that influence over a number of provinces and also nationally. Um, so, so as a result of that, you may find a lot of independent candidates just locating themselves either in a province, in a region, um, without having that sort of national reach. So there's a lot of you know there's a lot of cons with, with regards to, to to candidacy, but then this leads me again to to the question now directly around whether will this lead to sort of a redress of the socioeconomic legacy of apartheid? I, I don't think so. I think we can we can have that conversation in the long term, in the very long term. I think for the moment, especially when you look at just the 2020 you know by elections, a lot of a lot of the people. Um, at least the voters were quite clear that you know established parties are the way to go. Even if you look at the you know the previous local government elections, uh, independent candidates did not get a lot of seats. Just these by elections, there were no awards given to independent candidates. Um, so I don't think South Africa is quite ready for that. Also, just looking at you know what in sort of political party talk is around the issue of the national question. Are you able to address or can you able to, are you able to have a sort of cohesive 
common political project in the country. And I think independent candidacy are not able to address some of those questions. In fact, you know, you know, part of the discussion in this country is about state capture, blah, 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 blah. So you'd find that obviously independent candidates would would be much more you know, easily disposed to sort of private capture or, or private interest capture, given that you know, to get to the top, you need a lot of funding, you need a lot of support organizationally. Um, so, so that definitely deals with quite a lot of issues as it pertains to a country that's, that's, that's not 30 years into democracy. Um, I think that's why I can leave it for um, maybe to take other rounds of questions. We'll circle back to you with questions from our audience members, if they have any. But thank you very much, Tapelo, for kicking us off and really indicating that this is about freedom of political choice. Yep. Um, let's go then to you, Nomkita. And Tapelo, if I could ask you to mute your microphone while we segue to Nomkita, um, okay. who I'm going to ask to unmute um, your camera as well as your microphone, please. For you, the question we want to ask is, is more in line with the experience that you've had working at the um, SADC Parliamentary Forum and the experiences that you bring to bear, the wealth of knowledge um, around the participation of women in politics. South Africa leads the region really by having a whooping 46% of women in parliament. Um, and it's placed second continentally within the architecture of the African Union community. Globally, South Africa sits at number 10. Uh, what <coughs> should lawmakers be mindful of when amending the electoral system uh, so that the gender equality gains that have been made in the last 30 or so years are not compromised or eroded, but are rather built upon positively? Uh, thank you, Bella, for the question. Uh, joining you to congratulate the, the chamber to host this important event, specifically during the 16 days of activism of no violence against women. As we all know that there could be no democracy if women are not there, if women are under siege. Uh, I thank the the, the chamber. And also to note that um, the country has responded very well to the president's clarion call that for the first five days of the 16 days, that is from the 25th to the 30th of November, we must observe a period of mourning, mourning about the victims of gender-based violence, which means that the president himself takes this very seriously. And also mourning for those who have succumbed to the COVID-19. Uh, going back to your, to your question of uh, the Concord judgment and also what the parliamentarians should be we mindful of so that we don't lose what we have. Mm -hmm. to, to start with, I, I don't think the judgment says, suggested that we should... Uh, throw the baby with the bath of water. We should re retain our gains, our gains, and look at the best practices in, from other countries. If I can give you an example of what is happening in, in Namibia. Namibia uses a two-pronged system, the proportional representation and also the constituency-based system. From my view, if uh, I was a parliamentarian, I would go for, the, for this approach and say, for the National Assembly, let's use the, the PR system. And then, for, and then for, for, for the National Council of Prov Provinces, we, we go for, for the constituency base. To address exactly what Tapelo has just said, that voters might not be very keen to vote for individuals. They are still loyal to the political parties. And then the question of resources. To mitigate that, South Africa uses two systems. For the National Assembly, the, the, the PR system, and then for the, consti uh, for the National Coun Council of Provinces, they use uh, the constituency based. But 
what they should be mindful of is that if the business is still the same, take for instance, South Africa has been on the in the forefront as far back as 2009, up to now in 2019, they the country failed to lock the 50 percent, which is required by uh, for by SDGs and also by static protocol. And why? Because the gender quotas are not regulated. They are not legislated. The political parties do as they wish. They can come in with lots of men. Take, for instance, in 2014, Ahang SA came with two men. Hence, I'm saying they need to be legislated. A good example is to use a policy which is called zebra listing where you put men and women in a PR list alternately. Let's say, for instance, if you have a man as number one, have a woman as number two. That way you will ensure that you have 50% female representation and 50% male representation. When the parliamentarians are there discussing this, they should consider that the two-prong system and also legislation of gender quotas use the two the the zebra listing to ensure that women get 50% seat because a political party can easily say we have uh, like in South Africa you have the 200 seats in the in the national assembly they decide that we'll put 100 men on top and then 100 women at the bottom and then what happens if they only win uh, 50 seats that means that they will go to the poli- to the parliament with only 50 50, 50 men, exactly what Ahang SA did. They put first two candidates as men, and then they want two seats. ANC is not uh, excused from that. Look at ANC, it does not use zebra listing. It will have first three candidates, men, and then a woman will come in as number four, as number five. What if they win three seats? It means it will only be men. So legislation of gender quotas should be central. And we should push that. It's all women at the parliament. And how through their women's parliamentary caucus, where women's multi-party women's caucus, where all women from all political parties are supposed to meet together to discuss issues that affect them as women. And as women at that stage, they will be able to go out of the caucus with one voice and go and sell this idea to their political parties. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nomkita, for that very clear clarion call and for the examples you cited from other parts of the sub-region. It's very apt then that we're turning to you, Tsepang, and if you could kindly unmute yourself and turn your camera on. We'd love to hear your perspective because you're really sitting in the hot seat um, as a woman parliamentarian um, for the government of Lesotho. You understand that your country uses a true pronged electoral system combining the constituency-based approach as well as the proportional representation approach. What do you think in amending South Africa's electoral system South Africa can draw lessons from Lesotho around, where should South Africa be mindful of potential pitfalls, for instance? Um, And what do you think can the gains be going forward? Um, And please do turn your camera on. Thank you. Okay, first of all, um, I'll talk to the, the gains that we can see or we can get with the with the with the mixed um mixed member proportion that we use in Lesotho we use the first past the post and that's a two-third um up allocation in the national assembly and then we also have one third which is through the first past uh the, the um, proportional representation now the gains that we get with this with this approach is the fact that women are able to be represented through the uh, PR model. Lesotho is a very patriarchal um, uh, society. And that being the case, it's very difficult for women 
to go through the primaries or even to go through in their own um, constituencies when they're competing with other, with other political parties. Now, the PR model allows for women to be considered because it forces government, it's legislated in, in, in Lesotho. So it forces government to take this, um, the, the, the one third, and we're using a zebra model like Nomkita has just indicated. Now the zebra model allows for women to come in at the same ratio that men come in. Um, so this makes it possible for women to get into parliament and getting into parliament, they can even get a cabinet positions. Once you're in parliament, there are no restrictions in the manner that you gain your position in parliament. So that's one gain for women um, when we have this, uh, 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 this approach. When we have the mixed member proportion, it, it also allows for democratic um, voice um, because the constituency model, it gives a voice in the sense that the communities determine who they want into parliament. Now, the two thirds majority clearly give that representation, but the challenge is with the um, first past the post, the, the manner that uh, candidates are selected or are considered by electorates to get into parliament is based on, sometimes it's really not um, uh, um, characteristics that one can consider. For example, it's based on popularity. How much do they like you in, in, in the area that you live in? How much you help communities? How much you provide us financial assistance, which really are not necessarily the, 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 the preliminary requirements for one to get into the National Assembly, where you expect one to be dealing with uh, critical issues that such as uh, uh, policy of the of, of, of the country so the PR model now allows for a diffusion in that manner because um, now parties can elect uh, people that get into the PR seats based on this uh, uh, the credentials that are necessary for example uh, your knowledge of, of issues in the country, um, your educational background, um, your the way you represent the minorities that might not necessarily be elected at the at the constituency based with the constituency based model. So that's another key thing to take as far as um, using this mixed member uh, model is concerned. Another gain that we consider with this is that the the first past the post, which is the constituency based approach it allows for um, the, the members to con to concentrate on the areas that they come from because when one looks at the national level there are some areas that may tend to be neglected so the constituency based model will make sure that uh, we don't forget um, other constituencies when we're dealing with national issues so so that so those are some of the gains with the with the mixing uh, uh, manner that we are using in Lesotho but we, we do have uh, the downfalls or the pitfalls that um, South Africa might want to uh, take note of. For example, in our, in, our, in, our part, in our National Assembly, cabinet is elected from the members of parliament. Now, the very members of parliament that are elected either coming from constituencies or coming in through a PR model. Now, for those that are coming in from the constituencies, once they're elected into cabinet positions, they tend to be a bias towards delivering services for their own constituencies. And now that brings a dilemma in terms of providing services nationally because one feels they have to own up to the constituency that brought them to parliament, which puts them in a fix because if they don't do that, then the electorates hold them accountable and they risk not getting the seat back again into par into parliament, not necessarily into cabinet. That's a conundrum that 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 um, they're facing. And the other one is uh, members of parliament. They're supposed to keep a keen eye. The backbenchers. We're supposed to be looking at what the cabinet is doing and ensuring that they deliver according to their promises or according to the mandate that they're given to by parliament. But now, if you're a member of parliament, that's a backbencher and you need to, you really scrutinize a minister that you're expecting services from for your own constituency. Um, that's also another dilemma. So it, it tends to make um, some members relax when they are looking at particular ministers that they need to be serviced by in their own constituency. So this compromises the accountability aspect that um, we have in parliament as, as, as those who come with constituencies. And for those that come without uh, constituencies, you find that there tends to be a certain um, level of um, 
they're not as respected as the ones that come in uh, based on their constituencies. It's like they're pushed into parliament and they do not deserve that space. So for some that might not necessarily, that might be affected by this mentality, then it, it, it really impacts on their performance in parliament. They tend to be um, relaxed or they tend to not want to voice their opinions more because they feel they don't have a space in parliament. So it's really important to ensure that everybody feels uh, comfortable enough and the electorates do not make that distinction that one is better than the other because they did not come in with the same uh, model in parliament. Um, these are some of the gains and the and the and the pitfalls that one might say we should watch out for that I can talk to for the time being. Thank you so much, Isabella. Thank you very much, Tepang. Um, those insights from Lesotho are so important to bear in mind at this moment that South Africa is in. Uh, Tapelo, let me come to you with a question that has come to us uh, from our audience members. And they are asking, I'm going to modify the question a little bit, um, but I'm gonna remain true to, to its essence. Would the new changes in the legislation uh, be able to create dismissal um, and recruitment of MPs and ministers, do you think? Look, I think that's, that's, that's part of the, the, the problem obviously now. I mean, um, parliament has two years to, to bring into effect the constitutional judgment or to at least amend the, the legislation on, on electoral act. Um, but part of the problem is that there is no sort of clause that talks about independent candidates and them being recalled um, or, or, or obviously being fired. So that, that, that's a problem. And, and joined to that is also then the problem of how they're going to be, to be funded. I mean, this, I think, you know, these sort of two legislations that talk about the, the funding for political parties at the public level, and there's another one funding for political parties at the private level. But none of that also talks about independent candidates, so which sort of also leaves space for you know, any sort of corruption can happen between the two. So I think that this legislation has, a, you know, quite a lot of impact as to how they will deal with those who make it into parliament and those who make it the different provincial legislatures. And there's, there has to be some recall mechanism for that. All right. Thank you very much, Tapelo. I'm going to loop back to you, Tsepang. Um, and Tapelo, if you could mute your microphone. Uh, thank you very much. With a question that asks, can the um, Constitutional Court decision be used to break the stranglehold of the party hierarchy on whom individual aspirant MPs are dependent for gaining a place on the party list? Um, and I'm asking you this question because you're a new entrant into the political market, having become an MP in 2017 and having really gone against a long standing force politically in Lesotho. So what are your views regarding the Concord's decision um, as potentially opening pathways uh, to remove uh, the shackles of existing political parties? Um, thank you so much, Isabella, for that question. I think uh, I can talk primarily to the Electoral Act. Uh, yes, granted, the, the, the Constitution can be amended, uh, but it will emanate from what the electoral challenges are, which uh, for us in Lesotho, we've, we're trying to deal with everything at the level of the Electoral Act. And that is where it really gives room for flexibility of individual uh, uh, independent candidates. And it also gives room for, for, for women um, participants in the electoral system. And it also gives room for navigating through the parties, the political parties, in order to create a space for various, um, uh, various groups of society. So that is where I think we can look at because the constitution, it talks globally to the right of every Musutu to participate in the electoral process. And Lesotho, by the way, it does not um, restrict individual candidates. You would know or you would recognize that in, in, in our current system, we have never had an independent that has gone to, 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 to parliament. And that is not because it's disallowed. It's just that, like Tapelo was saying earlier, it's a very uh, difficult uh, uh, space to navigate and 
particularly for women. But when and when one is not known from a particular uh, political party, because for people to recognize you, a lot of times they're not. They look at your political background, and that would have been uh, created through your political party. So like Nomkita has also indicated, the Women's Caucus has a lot of influence in determining the structure or the, 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 the outcome of the political, um, of, the, of, the, of the policy that determines how people participate in the political system. And Women's Caucus can also have an influence in how the Electoral Act is um, crafted to make room for everyone, particularly women, to engage in that space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tsepang. I'm going to um, thank you, Nick uh, Stadlin, for that question. Um, and I hope that the examples that Tsepang cited from Lesotho have offered some insights into how the game can play. Let me turn to you, Nomkita, um, and really inquire from you, um, if you could turn your camera on and your microphone on for us, please. What is the game-changing move that South African women can make to produce better and deeper transformation from a male dominated political culture, uh, given the changes that are afoot. What is the game changing move that you think South African women can make? Uh, thank you for that question. I don't want to say there will be less corruption because we're sitting right in front of the state capture and we have seen so many women uh, being called to, to come and, and answer some questions. Uh, going back to the question again, um, I think if you are not at the table, people were, nobody will listen to your needs. And yet if you are at the table, you are able to express your needs. There are two things you can be there for at the table. It's either you are there to be part of the menu, to be eaten, or you are there to push the needs of your constituency. So let's take, for instance, if there's no woman at the parliament who will listen with mercy on issues affecting women, a good example, the gender-based violence, or during the COVID-19, we've seen how women are being abused. And if there's no one who has experience of being abused, Nobody will express those views wholeheartedly. But at the same time, being mindful that at the end of the day, a parliamentarians are at the parliament at the mercy of their, of their political parties. It depends to that particular political party, whether it is an interest of that particular political party to bring this to, to the house. Having more women at the parliament we believe that uh, women's needs will be listened to, women's needs will be acted upon, and that there can be no democracy without having women. We need them. But at the same time, we need strong, capable, educated women. Women who are not there just for the sake of the political party. Women who are there for their constituencies. So let Thank me you, stay Bella. with you um, then, Nomkita, and continue on this thread that we're on. What mm -hmm. is it that industry leaders, business, for example, in South Africa can do to ensure that that pipeline of strong, independent, um, game-changing women come forward in politics and transgress the barriers that traditionally women face um, in terms of securing political power? Mm -hmm. I think it's Bell, it's, uh, it's Tepang who mentioned something about resources. And uh, Tepelo mentioned something about resources. That because politics are very expensive, uh, elections are very expensive. If you don't have resources, you'll end up staying in that little corner, your constituents, and yet you are ambitious that I don't want to remain in the Eastern Cape only. I want to go to national. And then you find that you are voted by, by, by only your province. And that province is not going to vote for you, all of it. If you take my province, it's a very huge province. It's then capable to talk about plus minus 6 million people. How are you going to transverse the province going to every corner? 
women are going to need to resources. Without resources, women will not win. Resources in terms of being able to research issues that affect them, being able to, to shape their messages and also resources to make them mobile to, to go around the province. And I believe that with women there, the private sector needs to support them because at the end of the day, the democracy of South Africa needs to be strengthened. The democracy of South Africa needs women. And also no investor will come to South Africa if we always hear of corruption, nothing is happening, no service delivery. And yet if we have women who are strong, educated, independent, who will not depend only on political parties to express their views. Private sector must come to the party and support such women. Even if you are not a president, you are there at the parliament. Parliamentarians have got a very big role to play for oversight. It won't be only ANC women who are there who will support everything, endorse everything that is said by the president and the ruling party. We'll have so many independent voices who don't depend to a political party. Thank you, Bella. Thank you very much, Nomkita. A very clear delineation by you of what uh, the captains of industry can do in terms of exercising their corporate citizenship uh, by supporting women candidates, whether they are in parties or independent to transgress the barriers that women have faced thus far in securing political power. Tapelo, there's a question that I think is best suited to be answered by you. Um, so if you could please unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Um, and then Sharon, this will be the last question I ask. I'll loop back to you. Um, it's from Nkanyiso Simelani. It says, um, who says, what are the positives or improvements that this judgment can bring to our electoral system in terms of accountability and governance? Over to you, Tapelo, for a quick response. And then Sharon, you can take it away. Well, just to reiterate earlier on the, the two that, that I could see at least immediately of. The, the first is that obviously ordinary citizens or voters who initially are dissatisfied with the political system and the options available to them by political parties, um, those, those independent candidates would be able to garner those votes, I think. Um, so to that extent, they're able to then deal with the issue of voter apathy. But as a, you know, connected to that then is the issue of making sure that established political parties are able to field much more, you know, better candidates at the different levels of, of political contestation. So obviously once you see that an independent, you know, candidate who is a reputable, you know, for example, Herman Mashaba uh, in the city of Johannesburg was a former mayor, quite a reputable uh, mayor at the time, he, he made some good strides, especially when he came to the issue of the electricity crisis and the billing system there, you know. Um, so obviously then the, the ANC or the DA or the EFF would be forced to then reform some of the nomination processes, making sure that ethically and morally, and obviously from a financial point of view that the, the candidates are able to withstand those opposition or candidate, uh, candidates. I mean, candidates, um, uh, people who are going to then stand as independent. So it, it, to that extent, th those are the two, I think, immediate issues that, that come off uh, the, the judgment as positives for it. Thank you very much, Tapelo. Um, I'd like to appreciate um, our guests, our audience, for all the questions you've offered us. They really added verve and vigor to the debate today. Um, Sharon, over to you. Thank you, Isabella. That was extremely professionally handled. I think I will go for some training. It goes to show what difference it's going to make. On the subject of training, I'd just like to ask Sepang a question, please. If you could turn on your camera, please, Sepang. Training typically is one of the ways we can learn and become competent and to feel empowered and to use those skills in the reality of delivering our day job. To what extent has Lesotho used training and education to support the transition? And to what advice would you give the South African government and the parliament or to public, private sector even, 
to support the training of these potential independents, male or female, to to be able to feel empowered, to have that steel rod in their spine and be able to do what they need to do nationally, but yet bring their, their voters with them at the same time and, and do what's right for the country over and above what's doing right locally. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that very pregnant question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, training is very, very key. And I don't think in Lesotho we've done close to enough. We, we, we are so much far from delivering the training that is necessary for every Musutu to understand exactly what it means for one to get into the governance of the country. And it is very important because it misdirects the votes when uh, the electorates now get in the process of determining who they want in a certain leadership space. Um, more often than not, there's a collective understanding that um, whoever you choose to get into parliament is the one that is necessarily going to deliver at the constituency level, which is at the local government space. And that misconception has really led us to where we are right now, where people are misdirected to the positions that they hold the, M the members of parliament are still doing the councillors' jobs at the at the, the local government uh, level because they are the ones that every individual runs to for services to be de to be delivered at the local level yet they have to be focusing at the policy issues and they have to be delivering for everyone not necessarily for the constituencies that they come from but now over and above that when one gets into the space of governance. Now, for example, like myself, I got into parliament only in 2017, but I made it a point that I'm here to learn. Now, and, and this is where the, the party line issues have to be very, very clear. Um, sometimes you find some members of parliament when they get frustrated by the political dynamics, they withdraw from attending parliament sessions. And that really, um, has a bearing on their personal performance. Um, and, and, and so there are so many trainings, which is very good that are offered at, at the parliament level. And it's up to the members of parliament to attend to them and to really get tuned to what they are providing because they make them stronger and more competent to lead in the spaces. Over and above that, I'm a member of SADC Parliamentary Forum. And I must really attest here that that is the space that has made me the member of parliament that I am today. And I can gladly say I'm very competent with issues of, uh, with national issues and even international issues because of the training, the empowerment that one gets at that level. And that is not because uh, the, the space is there, but it's because myself personally, I decided to take this and make it um, a space for me to learn on all the issues. So really training, I was simply showing that it emanates from the constituencies. The electorates have to learn and understand who does what at what level so that we don't mix uh, positions. And then a person, when you get into this space, you also have to push yourself to be to be empowered. But the, the, our electoral commission, no, 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 the IEC, yes. It's also the one that's supposed to provide as much voter education as possible. And it's not doing nearly enough as far as that is concerned. We only see movement when we are in the election time. And that really um, beats uh, the, the whole purpose of it being a commission that's supposed to educate um, Basutu on how the, 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 the elections, the structures and everything um, are, 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 are configured for everyone to, to, you know, to be able to participate in a very informed manner. That, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, I think of just Joe Public, whether you are in the United Kingdom, Lesotho, South Africa, political dynamics are complex in the first place. So my, I think the, the information we got here from you was maybe there's an opportunity here for the private sector to join in and see if they can help educate the voters, but equally to, to help and support the independents. Japan, can I ask you to turn your mute button on? Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, Chipello, I think I'd like to ask you the next question. Okay. 
If you look at what has been given as an opportunity to South Africans to be able to stand as an independent, what kind of people are likely to want to take on something we have heard today is not going to be an easy job. It, you're going to need fortitude of character and more and more and more um, quality, skills, capabilities. So who's likely to take this opportunity? Look, I mean, it, it, it depends where you are, whether at local government level, at provincial or at national. But, but, but certainly at the top of my mind are people who've left the more established political parties that would be interested. Um, the obvious one obviously would be the, those who've left the ANC, but also more recently are those who've left the Democratic Alliance through Herman Mashaba um, and others as well. Um, but, but obviously another layer to, to the people who would be interested in running as independent candidates would be those from, from grassroots movements, community-based organizations who have played quite an important role in the sort of, uh, you know, in, in protest movements in their areas. You know, I have, I have quite a few, obviously in Gauteng, you can talk about KZN with Abasali Basim John Dolo, which is quite a big uh, political movement in, in, in the, in the KwaZulu-Natal province. So, so certainly those, those layer of whether activists or, or people who were and have just left political parties would certainly take up this, this opportunity. Um, but, but obviously the things that I talked about, you know, around organi organizational strength, experience, not so much, but, but certainly funding would, mm. would form a big hindrance for those who want to, to run mm. as, as independent candidates. Another question I just want to ask you quickly, and it's something I don't know the history about around it, so I'm going to do my best to frame the question. It's around the alignment of the, uh, the 24 months of this, the, the court. What happens if in 24 months Parliament is not able to make changes that properly address the areas as per con court? And aligned to that is, do the... Additionally, do the changes have to really be enforced in 2024 at the national and provincial elections when you've actually got in 2026 some local government uh, elections? So I think the question is around aligning local, national and the ruling all coming into place. Is there a complexity in the Concord timing or not? Yeah, so I'm not trying to understand it, you know, I understand your question, but, but let me answer it in the way that I can. You'll tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm correct here. So they've been given two years. The next sort of national elections are in 2024. You know, what has usually happened is that parliament would, would, would not adhere to the two years deadline. They would in fact be able to produce a, a, an act of parliament on the third year, probably. It's, it's, it's happened before. Um, but, but even then, when, when then that act or reformation is not in alignment with the constitutional court judgment, usually, as, 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 as is the case right now, a lot of the NGOs would, be, would, would then go back to the courts and say, well, actually, this is not in alignment with the Concord judgment. So that can happen, and that has happened. So there's precedent to that effect. Um, I, I would see the comment that you made you know, you know, around perhaps there should be better preparation for the local government elections 2026 as opposed to the national elections 2024, given obviously there would be you know, a higher fielding of independent candidates at the local government level. That makes sense, but I think four years does give parliament adequate and sufficient time to, to prepare for the 2024. And especially because there are individuals who are prepared to run for, for those you know, provincial and national elections. So I think there's space and I think th there's, a, there's a lot of time for legislature for and parliament to also consult with a number of NGOs on this matter and how that should look like, whether it should be a mixed system, just like you find at local government level, um, between constituency and then peer system, which which would be at best, you know, it, it would adhere to the sort of ethos or the values of the Concord judgment. Um, but yeah, it remains to be seen, but, but definitely a lot of community-based organizations and NGOs do have a role to play once there's no, or there's a misalignment between them, the act that's reformed and the Concord judgment. Thank you. Um, I think this is going to probably be our last question. Nankita, if I could speak to you, please. Can you bring yourself up on camera? 
Thank you. Welcome back. I'd like to ask a question and this sort of aligns a bit to the zebra uh, process of getting your male female in. If you've got an independent and that independent is a female, given the history of how difficult it is to actually get the biases of the voters, the biases of people, of other people in parliament, the historic behaviors, the male dominated society, all those things that we are having to deal with, how, how possible is it that we're going to get some female independence making it to parliament? And in what period of time do you think that's feasible? Uh, thank you, Sharon, for this question. I think it is a pralisting. I aligned it with the approach that I'm proposing, that the National Assembly retains the PR system, right. specifically to cater for the SADC protocol, Article 12 and 13 in SDG 5 in Maputo protocol, so that we don't lose that 50-50. And then, therefore, the zebra listing will be suitable for that setting, the National Assembly. And then for the, for the constituency-based system, I suggested that it goes to the National Council of Provinces. It's not going to be plain selling, as <laughs> the colleagues have said, that it also has a mentality of voters. Uh, South Africa is a very patriarchal uh, country People might say, even us as women, we prefer a man than a female. It's not going to be easy for, for women if we come up with that system. Mm -hmm. Look what is happening presently in, um, in, in, in Namibia. Yesterday they had elections for the National Council and local government. I've not heard the, the results, but I know women are, have struggled to, to get enough foods. Um, in Malawi, how... They are working on it because it's straight like in Botswana, first past the post, it takes it all. So there are no adjustments. As a result, you'll find that Malawi and Botswana are some of the countries who are at the tail end in, in SADC. And Malawi is working towards saying, okay, we'll continue with constituency-based system, but there should be certain constituencies that are made only for women. Party A, B, C, D, bring women so that women can battle it or alone in that particular constituency. Okay, they thought okay. they would implement it last year, but they couldn't because at the end of the day, women belong to political parties. If your political party says, we don't want that system, mm. they are going to be outvoted in the, uh, at the house and the whole proposal will fall apart. Okay. So <laughs> I think I've answered. Complex. Thanks. Yeah, so we, it, it's not something that we are expecting massive successes at in the next short period of time. But what I do admire is all the people who are working so hard at doing things to bring forward independence, to bring the, the local voice and also to bring the gender and therefore the gender related issues into the national space. So I'd like to thank all the participants on the panel today. If you'd all just please turn your cameras on for a moment and virtually hands up if any of those can do it on the side. I'd like to give you all a clap and to thank you very, very much. Isabella, you were awesome. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your approach and to the panelists, your insights and knowledge and your ability to express yourself was actually made some things that for me are totally ununderstandable. I actually had a, a bit of a good glimpse and understanding of what the issues are in question. So thank you very much for enlightening me as you've done in the, the days ahead of today. And I hope others in our team feel the same way. So thanks very much to everybody. Thanks those for attending. And it was very good to see our attendance ratio stayed high right up until now. So thank you very much, everybody. And there will be a recording available and there'll be, I think we've still got four, three or four more webinars for the rest of this year of uh, a business nature, uh, social wine drinking nature, if you'd like to join us, and personal, mental, well-being, health, as well as yeah, promoting what young SMEs have done in business to um, succeed 
in running their own company. So that's also very interesting, very heartwarming when I listen to those kind of stories. And to everyone else, if I don't have any contact with you between now and the new year, I wish you a merry Christmas, festive season, whichever one works for you. And I wish you all well. And for you down in the warmth of South Africa, please stay safe from COVID. For all of us up here in the UK, we're all locked down at the moment. So let's hope that we are able to get out and be able to bubble with our families over Christmas this year as well in the cold. So hopefully the COVID doesn't enjoy the cold. I think it's the other way around, unfortunately. So to everyone, thanks very much. Isabella, a special thanks to you, Nomkita, for arranging it, and for Ziando, who is still with us, for arranging this right from the beginning. Thanks to the team.